Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 47. 47. 47. 47. Oh, it's such a significant number. Is it? it is, 40, mm. is there 47 anything? I don't know. I feel like there is. There were 47... Oh, it's 47 Ronan. Are there? Isn't that a Keanu Reeves oh. film? <laughs> I don't know if that's a, like a historical Japanese thing or it's just like the name of a film. They just made it up. Maybe there isn't 47. Yeah. Maybe it's something like three and then you've just got... Oh, there's 47 yeah. <laughs> and 47. It was a big day. Yes. How are you, Nick? I'm all right. Yes. Back into working from home, which I do not like. But, you know, comfy trousers the whole time. Well, I was wearing jeans at work anyway, so... Yeah, but, you know, you can wear like elasticated trousers. What even are jeans? <laughs> what are you wearing jeans at home? Are you a psychopath? I don't own elasticated trousers. Oh, you've not lived, mate. No. Think of all the comfort you're missing out on. Apart from my pyjamas, but I'm not wearing them during the day. <laughs> so. This is further confirming you as a gentleman of the olden times, Nick, in your top hat and your penny farthing bicycle. A man should well, not wear his of... pyjamas of an of afternoon. But no, I must. If I'm going to be stuck at home for a while, I must investigate and perhaps invest in um, a lot of elastic clothing. Yeah. Elastic trousers is fine. Elastic the rest of clothing, not not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Got elastic shirts and elastic <laughs> pants. It's all just elastic. Just get some nice harem pants. That's what uh, that's what uh, us basic white bitches do. That's my dream. Me, me and my basic white bitch ways. Just have your harem pants and a nice Chardonnay in the that's afternoon. That's what I'm going for. Oh, sorry. Not a Chardonnay. That's insane. A Pinot. <laughs> Balapino. Yes. Any poisonings? this week uh no no again not really been allowed out of the house no but if you were so, oh yeah oh if i mean if i was there oh death and destruction all around me but i think um, you'd find that i mean the world seems to be taking care of all the poisoning <laughs> for us super strain and kent just grows ever more terrifying <laughs> that's why we don't leave the house you had like a military test today didn't you yes for covid not just not like exercise or anything because <laughs> i'm joining the army <laughs> What kind of elasticated trousers do you have in your uniform? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's that kind of quiet military precision that's gently going on around us. And we're just like, let's just, just pretend this isn't happening. It's yes. fine. It's all good. Needs to be done. Let's get it over and done with. It does. We hope all of you are safe and well wherever you are. Make sure you are staying safe. Listen to the rules. Stay in. Protect yourselves. Well, you know what we need to do, Nick? Yes. As we are being reflective in this time of lockdown, I think it's time to thank our Patreon subscribers. Well, quite. So thank you very, very much. Thank you to Sarah Richard. And thank you to Liana Bourne. You're very, very sexy. Very marvellous people. Very marvellous. Thank you very much. And good names as well. I like spy names. I quite like them. Well, Liana, very Game of Thrones there. Oh, it is. And Bourne, she's a spy. Yes. Game of Thrones medieval spy. (laughs) Like it. With a great sword and a gun. (laughs) That would that would cover all bases, wouldn't a it? A dragon and a bazooka. One of the dragon is holding the bazooka. <laughs> Sorted. Yep, absolutely fine. The thing is, if you carry a great sword around, it's fucking heavy. Oh, it's a lot of effort. That's never shown in any of the historical dramas. Just how heavy a bloody great sword is. That it's just it's one swing you've got, and then you have to have a sit down. <laughs> as is my understanding. Oh, as as Sinead often in battle. Um. <laughs> Oh, can you imagine me in a medieval battle? I would not fare well. <laughs> no, none of us would. <laughs> Just take a five foot two person running around trying to drag a sword out, shouting at everyone for getting in my way. I would, I would get knackered before I got to the battlefield, probably. Just a march there would kill me. Um, <laughs> Carrying the heavy things. I don't do those well. When they say it is two days' ride, I'm like, are you joking? Two days? I'll be I'll dead a by then. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> How many snacks will there be on the way? <laughs> well, Nick. Yes. Are you ready? Ooh. To drink cocktails and talk about poison. I think it's about time for a cocktail. Or Definitely. we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. No, no, I'm going for the cocktail. I have not had a cocktail. I'm saying I have a cocktail. I've not had any beverage since New Year's Eve. You've had like water and soft drinks. Well, I've had water, yes, but no alcoholic beverage. Since New Year's Eve. That's, that's That was a week ago. I know. Madness. How are you alive? <laughs> There's a wonder that descends across me and probably some of our listeners of like, my God, no, no one has ever not drunk for that long. What's it like? <laughs> has your liver completely rehealed? Are you at one with nature? No, no, really no, not. No. <laughs> I'm just mainly eating biscuits. So um. <laughs> I like it. I haven't had a drink for about three or four Hours. days. Uh, well, yeah. But lockdown, you just do that. You just suddenly realise you're drinking every day, sort of starting at four and then just descending. So I was like... Nope. 
no, not really. <laughs> That's just you. Yeah, and it's been great. <laughs> Thank you very much. So it's definitely time for a cocktail. We've decided. Yes, though I'm slightly hesitant about the cocktail we're going to have, I must admit. Oh, Nick, have faith in me. Well, it is my story this week. Hooray, hooray, hooray. But of course, we can't, we can't, we can't possibly tell a story without a cocktail in hand. And for that reason, I have chosen Secret Ingredient. As you know, every week we pick a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell and will flavour our cocktail of the week. And... This week, the wonderful secret ingredient I have chosen is Valentine's meat juice. I mean, it's a classic. <laughs> There's rarely a cocktail without it, I think you'll find. Oh, such a magical remedy, my friends. Often in my cupboard. Absolutely. absolutely. The cocktail cupboard, medicine cabinet, always in there. Valentine's meat juice. So I chose this one. Now, it does figure in the story very prominently. There is a reason. But how can I not include this? Because it's a proper old-timey 1800s remedy. It is something that will give you a pick-me-up. It will look after you. It will cure all your ills. So I'll tell you a little about uh, Valentine's meat juice. Would you like to know? You go for it. Because you're probably terrified about what it involves. <laughs> well, I'm thinking some sort of meat would be involved. <laughs> no, it was invented in 1871 by the art collector and merchant Man Valentine. His first name was Man, with two N's. Good name. Good name. He allegedly invented it, that he made it to cure his wife's stomach ailment. There was some inference that she actually had stomach cancer, but very serious stomach condition. Um, but in then inventing the Valentine's meat juice, uh, it cured her of her ailments. It is made by getting basically a hunk of raw beef. So it's beef. It's cow. Then you've got you to gotta get the raw beef, tear it apart, you know, render the fibres. Then you heat it, and then you press out the liquid... And there you have the Valentine's meat juice and then you drink it. I mean, it's a classic, really. It's it's only going to do you good things. Absolutely. It, well, it worked on Valentine's wife. Um, and then when it was in production, it was a sensation. Loads of famous people swore by it. George V used it. President Garfield, he said it helped him recover after his assassination attempt. So, yeah, people do. Nice. Lots of people used it to help children with cholera. Because, as you can imagine, obviously terrible stomach trauma and loss of essential fluids and nutrients and so forth. Um, having just raw meat juice will, will I'm help. I'm you're not... No, you're not going to get any nutrients out of squeezing a cow. Well, it's a lot of I'm iron. Sorry. It's a lot of iron and protein. And you're losing You're not that. eating the meat, though, are you're you? You're just getting the juice. You're getting the goodness. You're just getting, you're just getting the liquid out of it. Juicing a beef... <laughs> Normally, you would drink it in a solution of water. Obviously, if you want a really good dose, you have it as an enema. I mean, who doesn't want that, really? A, a meat a meat juice enema. I mean, that's just... It rolls off the tongue, really. Well, Nick, I have a special twist for you for today's cocktail. <laughs> uh, no, don't worry. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I delivered you the big syringe, Nick. <laughs> There's a quote from the British Medical Journal, and this was also reprinted in the Philadelphia Medical Journal uh, in 1900. Now, this could have been the cocktail that I could have forced you to make. Rectal feeding in exhaustion following children's ailments. So this is the I mean, cocktail. it sounds damn tasty. So one egg beaten, Valentine's meat juice, about one tablespoon, uh, some milk, sterilised, obviously, you know, you'd be careful. Brandy, salt, <laughs> sterilised water, that makes about five ounces of it, and then you mix it, and two ounces should be injected warm every two hours. Nice. I mean, why aren't we doing that? That sounds fun. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Now, Nick, have you managed to obtain any Valentine's meat juice for this week's cocktail? I've been I've been to the supermarket, and they they were fresh out. Um, <laughs> when I when I asked the the people there, they said, "Where do you stock your uh, Valentine's meat juice?" They said, "Usually it's there, but we're fresh out." They said there was a rush this morning, apparently, and, and actually on social as well. This is the one of the ingredients that we've put out. 100% of people have just gone, what the fuck? What? What? What is it? So, no one's even attempted to think of what it could be. They're just like, well, then, then why? 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 People will be surprised to learn. It is not actually available anymore. <clears throat> Did you squeeze a cow? Yes, I had to go out and buy a cow to squeeze. <laughs> um, so, so no, unfortunately. Aww. So what have you managed to come up with as a substitute? Is it another form of enema? I mean, I, I must admit, I've never heard of a cocktail being taken in enema form. I have. Um, uh, okay. I mean, it wasn't a good story. There's just weird <laughs> things you hear about with people taking alcohol <laughs> rectally and, and just strange things that people do to get you drunk. Right. Just for the hell of it. I must admit, I've not come across those. You go to very different websites than I do. It was a very strange family Christmas. It was. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the bull shot would have been a perfect one to do for this um, but we've mm. already done it and I'm never doing that again <laughs> <laughs> it would have made you cry it would have made me cry so we've gone for a meat hook cocktail oh I like 
like it. I like the meat is in there. Nice yep. meat hook. You might hang your bit of beef on well, there. Well, exactly. It's a bit abattoir-y. Actually, the, I think the bar that it was invented, it was called L'Abattoir in Canada. So, yes, yeah, so I thought we've got the theme going on, if not necessarily the specific ingredient. Interesting. Well, I'm very intrigued to see what you've come up with. Yes. So, as ever, because we're in lockdown, Nick has delivered me some secret ingredients. I had to give him some mystery ingredients, not knowing what they were going to be used for today. <laughs> but we have our little cocktail, so it's time for us to go into our isolation kitchens, break our drinking fast, and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. I'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick, a meat hook. Meat hook. Oh, it meat sounds hook. scary and sore-like and, and, and meaty. Sounds, well, hopefully not. I'm too honest, I'm hoping it's not meaty. Okay. Because um, <laughs> I think that will be upsetting. So, we have a what, a variation on a red hook. Ooh, Ooh, delicious. Which is one of my all-time favouritest cocktails. So, we're back in the, the regions of the brown, which have generally do as well. I'm not sure how this one's going to go. It's got ingredients that are not usually my... Thing. So as Sinead said earlier, she had to run out and, or she had to deliver some ingredients to me that I didn't have. Okay, so uh, so I know some of the stuff, but uh, let's dive in and taste the meat hook. Cheers. Hmm. Now that's going to get you messed up. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah, that's weird. No, that's not for me. That's not as good as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll talk us through it first. Explain the ingredients, because then I think we have notes. The, the main body of this is a rye whiskey. Yeah. I'm no expert at all. I don't drink whiskey. Um, so rye, as opposed to Scotch, as opposed to Irish. Mm. It's, I, I don't know. It's not my it's not my area. It's quite harsh. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got a red vermouth in there, which adds a little bit of sweetness. Then we have a, a dash of maraschino, but it is a teaspoon full. Yeah. And then some Islay whiskey in there as well again a couple of teaspoons in theory to add some sort of peatiness going on in there yeah so that's quite the strange variation compared to a red hook where you've got the sweetness of a bourbon and yes. you you're lacking the the islay so we've used an ardbeg which is a, a absolutely beautiful islay malt mm. whiskey if you're into your islays they are peaty they have got a smokiness to them they're absolutely gorgeous just to drink and the, the tiniest amount has been added to it because they're so powerful of flavor so i was kind of looking forward to this thinking oh there'll be a peatiness to it it with some sweetness but we don't really drink rye we normally use bourbon which is a bit sweeter whereas this you know what for a whiskey drinker they would enjoy that yeah I'm yeah. sure I'm sure absolutely I'm sure it'd be very popular with some people it's just not my it's just not my cup of tea second sip I've done a second sip of that and I actually yeah. prefer it now no nah, I don't it's growing on me <laughs> it's not I, I can see it's not your cup of tea I'm not a whiskey drinker at all I'm not so, really no. a whiskey drinker but I do like a an Irish whiskey I do like a really nice bourbon I do like a good scotch but maybe you would actually just have the Islay on its own or the rye and then use the other ingredients for fancier things. A lot of people would absolutely love that. I know, I know a few people who would who would really like that. Yeah. Um, just because it's got, it's got that whiskey. Um, that is the predominant flavour to it. It's just not my it's not my cup of tea. But other people would love it, I have no doubt. I'm probably in the same camp as you, Nick, is that I don't mind that. I probably mind it less than you. But I really now wish I was drinking a Red Hook instead. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so much so, I'm tempted to go and make one. <laughs> so yeah, Meat Hook, not a winner. The brown drinks have finally failed us, I fear. They have failed us. The brown drink. I'm sure, as I say, some people will love it. It's not for us. No, just have an Islay and just have a rye maybe <laughs> on its own. Don't mess around with it. Good for around the fire, end of an evening sort of thing. It's not a classic, but it is certainly a well-respected and well-liked drink. But it's but messing with the classic, though, isn't it? I know, I, 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 I disagree, because I think... <laughs> The, I, I mean, there are there are so many cocktails which have variants on anything else, mm. and it's just that I don't like it. Other people love it. I'm not going to say it's a bad cocktail. There are some cocktails which I think no, that is just a bad drink. Yeah, this one is just not to my taste. Yeah, not an incident in a glass. This one just not to our taste. Give it a try, guys. If you've got it, you will have all the ingredients. I think most of you see how you feel about it. And whiskey drinkers out there, tell us what you think. Is it absolutely your cup of tea? Would you be? Is this the cocktail you've been waiting for all your lives? Or all of this podcast with the meat hooks sort of we've left those on the side we're not going to talk about those again we're going to saunter down the road kind of going yeah you know what someone else can have it someone else can have it someone else can have it uh we've got our emergency cocktails in hand yes because indeed. cocktail number two has come in play into play indeed oh, what do you have so i was inspired by the meat hook i've got i've made myself a red hook and how is it it's delicious it's delightfully marvelous i have made myself a negroni Coming round to the regular Negronis, you know, not just a Mezcal one. I've got a gin one, so... Yeah. But there we are. Are you ready for a story, Nick? 
I want a story. Now, you may be asking why, why, why did I bring Valentine's meat juice into this whole business? Why did I bring this to your door? Well, I'm assuming it had something to do with the story. It, we, um, I hope so. <laughs> that, that was the reason I thought why you had done well, it. Well, let's carry on and find out, shall we? <laughs> shall we? Valentine's meat juice does indeed appear in one of the most famous and thrilling poisoning cases in history. It's one that many people will be aware of. I'm surprised we have not reached it already. I think this has been on my list from day one and it's taken 47 yes. episodes. <laughs> it's on the list, but you're going, I'm doing that one. I was doing that one. I'm doing that one. So no one was else was allowed to touch it. Well, exactly. I sort of saw it from the beginning. I was like, oh, definitely going to do that one. But then we found so many other poisoning cases. I was like, save this one for the, for the epic episode that is episode 47. Mm, Absolutely. Yes. That real sort of milestone episode number 47 absolutely that's that that was my plan all along <laughs> as you can imagine we are telling today the tale of florence maybrick da, da, da. it's about time people say accused of murdering her husband and whose in-laws or her husband as well if theories are to be believed may have been hiding an even more deadly secret than the murder of one man <laughs> Do you like the scene setting very I did dramatic. there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very, very impressed. Good. I'm enraptured. <laughs> so this is a great case because it has so much to it. It really does have everything and it does have some crazy wild theories at the end. It's definitely a thinker and one for debate, I think. I don't think we've come across one that's more debatable since maybe Adelaide Bartlett or even Dr. Crippen. But let's dive in and see what you think. You are indeed. So Florence Maybrick was born in Mobile, Alabama in 1862. Two. Yes. Yes. Her father died when she was quite young. Her mother married, married again, a German cavalry officer named Baron Adolf von Rox. Nice. Oh, yeah. That's good. <laughs> I like that. That's a good name. And her stepfather's position necess- necessitates them needing to travel a lot in her youth. Childhood seems pretty uneventful. There's nothing massively written about whether it's bad, whether it's good. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. She's, you know, privileged. But it's during one voyage with her family from America to England when she was 18 years old that she would meet the man who would change her life for better or for worse. (laughs) James Maybrick, a cotton merchant from Liverpool who frequently travelled across the Atlantic for work. He meets Florence on the ship and the attraction is instant. (gasps) The two spend quite a lot of time together alone, and it is remarked upon by the other passengers, the gossipy passengers of the ship. What will the Baron say? (laughs) I don't know if the Baron was there. I've got to confess, are you picturing the Baron as just kind of with a monocle and a kind of crazy Baroness? Well, no, so I've I've got uh, a Baron Munchausen sort of thing going on. (laughs) Um, I'm I'm thinking perhaps the ship is either in a whale or perhaps like a big airship. And it's, a, it's floating by a big balloon. Yes, or it's someone's hat and it comes out of the ocean. Or it's yeah. on someone's hat, yes. <laughs> um, so that's that's what I'm going with. Well, this romance is happening while all that shit is going on around Excellent. them. Excellent. Yeah, they're not distracted by it at all because they're lost in each other's eyes. But yes, people are remarking upon this, um, this you know, oh my goodness, they're spending a lot of time together alone. Now, Florence is 18 years old. She is a southern belle, really, in, in every sense of the word. Whereas James is 42. Yeah, it's a bit older. Not a young man. But what the attraction was, we we, we don't know. Cotton. Cotton. (laughs) Bags of cotton wool. He can make her such luxury makeup pads. It's wonderful. (laughs) I'm thinking daddy issues are probably a thing here. You know, loses a father young. (laughs) But we're not here to judge just yet. (laughs) But the couple's romance would blossom. They would be married in 1881. And they move to... Liverpool, where he is from, they move into a very lovely mansion. It's called Battle Crease House. Again, an excellent name. There's a lot of good names in this one. And it's a, it's a lavish mansion. It said they have a cook, two maids, not one, but two, uh, later a nanny to care for their children. They have staff. And this is quite a you know, remarkable property as well in Liverpool, in the district that they live in. And from the start, having such lavish accommodation, the Maybricks are quite happy to embrace the social scene. Florence certainly wants to be seen out and about at the finest of balls and soirees. She wants to host parties. She wants to have the best clothes and the best furniture. Well, I'm thinking it must be quite a different thing to go from the estates and things of Alabama to Liverpool, to Liverpool, which at this time, industrial revolution, (laughs) smog, factories, hustle and bustle, mad, busy. Not not so much the Great Plains and the the sweeping estate. No, no, indeed not. It's still a nice area. You know, they're living in there and they're... Is, there are, you know, there is society, there are, you know, balls to attend and people to impress. But she comes from a decent family. She's married a successful older businessman. You've got to think she's she's not stupid. She, you know, was 
pretty much signing up for a quite a lavish lifestyle, let's say. And James indulges her at first and obviously enjoys going out as well. But it's not before long before the financial difficulties start to mount up, along with the bills. Mm. James grants Florence a oh, £7 a week household budget. My God. <laughs> God, such things. That's used up pretty swiftly. Florence yeah. begins to borrow money against her expensive jewellery. She also obtains loans against expected land inheritance that she thinks she's got coming to her back in America while writing to her family, who are still very much alive. <laughs> and the pressure of all of these financial difficulties that, you know, she's not stopping going out. She's not keeping to any budget that James sets her. And he's getting quite harsh with her and saying, you need to rein in the spending. She wants to go out. She wants to have fun. She's a young woman. She goes on to have two children. But, you know, she wants to be the lady of the manor and have this life. If she can't afford to do it, then don't bloody do it. <laughs> well, maybe she just thought she was entitled and that James is well, flourishing in his cotton business. Well, he's doing well for herself. Well, not that well, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on what she's spending it on. Okay. She's having zebra brought in to furnish all of her parties. Only the finest swan will be served. Well, she shouldn't be doing it. So the strains on the marriage begin. Further pressure is added that the couple all almost lose their son to scarlet fever. They also have to send the daughter away because of this illness to stop her from getting sick. And Florence loves the kids. She's a very good mother and she doesn't want to lose them. Um, she also hears about her brother dies of consumption while he's in Paris. So it's starting to worry. And, and James himself... He's not looking so good. No, is he not? No. Mm. But this is a very rare case in which his ill health is both exactly what you might think and not at all what you think it is. Oh, okay. Confused? Uh, I mean, I'm intrigued how you're going to match <laughs> those two together, but go for it. Well, what you might think is that maybe something has been slipped to James and he is succumbing to some sort of venomous ailment, shall we say? James is something of a hypochondriac. Now, he caught malaria in 1874, it's thought, and he was treated with a remedy containing a certain poison. And he begins to rely on this remedy. He begins to rely on its amazing restorative effects. And since then, he has continually been taking natural remedies, quack cures, any pills he can get his hands on, restorative powders, anything that will keep him in shape or tend to the phantom sicknesses, or more likely now, drug addictions, <laughs> that he has yes. built up. And Florence learns that her husband has been taking all of these drugs, predominantly arsenic. Well, it's a healthy way to go. And strychnine. I mean, yeah, it's going to do you the world of good, I'm sure. <laughs> Indeed. Arsenic alarm, arsenic alarm, arsenic alarm. Yes, he has literally been taking, as we've said before, all these things about arsenic and strychnine and all these things slipped well, into... Good old pick-me-up. Definitely. He believes they are powerful pick-me-ups. So he's looking sick, as we were, I thought, because of poison, but it's all his own doing. Local druggists know James well because he's been buying huge quantities of arsenic and other poisons maybrick once told his associates one of his associates around 1883 it is alleged you would be horrified i dare say if you knew what this powder is it is arsenic we all take some poison more or less for instance i am now taking arsenic enough to kill you <laughs> i take this arsenic in once in a while because i find it strengthens me okay poisons the greatest poison of them all. <laughs> but despite this apparent openness with certain colleagues, James does not like it when his wife mentions his uh, poison taking. His poison addiction. <laughs> his poison addiction around anyone else. And you can probably understand why. Yeah, probably. <laughs> she does ask him and sort of mentions to his brother going, you know, he's taking arsenic every day. And he promptly tells her to mind her own business. But things are getting worse still. Aside from all of the poison addictions and the ill health and the debts that are mounting up, Florence in 1887 makes a devastating discovery. She discovers that around £100 a year is disappearing from the family and business accounts to be paid to James's mistress. Ooh, scandal. And she can't have a nice hat. She can't have a nice she hat. She can't have zebras at the parties. No, she is just limited to a painted horse. <sighs> a pygmy horse. It's Has tiny. You can barely see it. Has ever been treated so dreadfully no one has suffered as she has no indeed not now this is a mistress he has kept for about 20 years she has allegedly borne him five children <laughs> and she's not the only one he nice. has mistresses all over the place james travels a lot yeah so one he has a woman in every, every port <laughs> in every port on every ship in every hill in every cathedral wow. when she confronts james he shows little concern 
for her displeasure. The, the Everything is really souring right now in the marriage. Florence, devastated and very upset by this turn of events, thinks, what to do, what to do? Well, she may as well get in on the shagging action. <laughs> well, quite. Why the hell not? Why not? Why not? He's having fun. She finds solace with a friend of theirs, uh, a man named Alfred Brearley. They conduct a short affair. They go off for a dirty weekend together. And I mention that because she, she books a hotel room under the name Mr. and Mrs. Maybrick, pretending that they are brother and sister. Right. Which is just stupid. That's just weird. Just pretend you're husband and wife. Well, yeah. Uh, but also, why use your married name? Yeah. Why use your husband's name? And then go up with your brother and shag his brains out loudly in the hotel room. Yes, brother and sister. I assume. Sing a double bed. That's fine. Don't need two singles. No. Exactly. It's fine. We will snuggle down together and then we will practice moving the furniture around the room and, and congratulating each other. <laughs> but the affair is short-lived because after this weekend together where they had planned to run away and do all sorts of dirty things over a week, maybe, or a week or more, uh, Alfred reveals he has another woman on the go and Florence is like, oh, for God's sake, she's back to square one. It does result though in this quite uh, heated exchange that happens between James Florence and Alfred really at the Grand National of all okay. places <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so they go to the Grand National yes it's a few days after the affair had technically ended uh, Florence is there with James and as they're going around they bump into Alfred her lover and she quite pointedly goes and takes his arm and walks the course with Alfred walks <laughs> off in Stop front it. of a husband and society everyone's like oh my goodness fanning themselves the shock the scandal well, see, has he not got a row of mistresses trailing behind him at this point though <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he brings them along with him on a lead. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking of horses. Ah. Uh, so it depends on how how fancy his mistresses are, <laughs> whether he let them out to the races, how big a hat they had. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> well, it is Ladies' Day. <laughs> <laughs> Bring out your mistresses. Bring out your mistresses. <laughs> Show them off. That does sound like bring out your dead. It does, yeah. <laughs> but yes, this little uh, display does not please James. It actually results in a very vicious row back at home. And, you know, horribly, James ends up beating his wife for yeah. showing him up in public. Now, the period that follows is just fraught with tension between the couple. Florence turns up at the doctor with a black eye saying at first she's unwell and kind of masking it and then confessing to the doctor saying she wants a divorce, she wants out of this marriage. James has said the same sort of thing to her, going so far as to tearing up wills in front of her and saying she'll never inherit from him. It's not like, I think they've spent everything, so it's not like she's got a lot hmm. to actually receive. But this fighting goes back and forth. The doctor tries to help Florent to tell James to stop taking these poisons, these drugs that are obviously not doing him any good whatsoever. And he also mediates a brief reconciliation james pays off some of florence's debts and at this stage they sort of get back together and there's a brief kind of accord an unsteady truce has been reached <laughs> but around this time in 1889 james's lingering illness the various ones that he has that would yeah which one there are many it would seem oh the many, well i think they all sort of you know form one big giant illness <laughs> one big super illness <laughs> super illness super covid and then they begin to worsen he definitely mm. takes a turn in the spring of 1889 this is early april he is suffering from persistent headaches and coldness of the limbs to me that screams drug addiction yeah. really actually yeah, starting to succumb to that but by the end of the month add in terrible terrible stomach pains and repeated stomach problems the vomiting the, the you know uh, all the yeah, other things yeah. we know what's going on there don't we yeah. <laughs> even with the assistance of trained doctors who come to the house and were welcomed in and give him medicine and give him curative measures james continues to self-administer allegedly arsenic and strychnine to cure himself keeps taking his pick-me-ups well absolutely haven't 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 killed him so far so this is going on upstairs but meanwhile as he is suffering florence is in another part of the house displaying some well potentially questionable behavior she is observed by the staff of the house soaking fly paper purposely to extract the arsenic from it subtle why was she doing this you might ask well there, i can't think of many reasons to be honest oh, there um, is a there is a very particular one. Oh, is there yes okay go on guess. she's going to spoon feed all the flies arsenic <laughs> water. no no okay not that one it's to make a face cream 
Yeah, yeah. Why shouldn't you just go and buy that? That stuff was available all over the place. Well, I'm not sure. This is where we would go, maybe why wouldn't you go out and buy arsenic soap? Yeah. But as many of us as know, we've shared it on the grid previously. Huge at the time, you bought facial soaps and creams full of arsenic to treat spots and blemishes, any skin complaints. Mm. This was a miracle cure. Women took arsenic, you put these arsenic cures on their face if they had an event to go to. Reportedly, Florence has had an eruption of the skin and is due at a fancy ball later in the month. So she's basically oh, had God, a breakout, needs to make a nice arsenic face mask. And apparently the soaking of flypaper is not uncommon of women of, of every household and kind of of different classes as well, you know, even the upper classes, they would soak the flypaper just to get arsenic as an easy way of getting it. Now, I don't, I have not read enough into this to, to, to determine whether arsenic was particularly expensive in the face creams. Maybe it was really a premium at the time because it was a restorative miracle cure. Yeah, maybe. But it wasn't an uncommon thing to soak the flypaper to get the arsenic out and then you would use it for all the home remedies. Well, I say, yeah, arsenic uh, in flypaper is going to be pittance because everyone needs fly paper mm. so it's going to be cheap in your local sort of cheapy shop but cheapy shop <laughs> the pound shop as you will yeah in the, the, pound yeah, in the sort of really working class sort of shops but your fancy cosmetics and things like that were obviously mm. were an entirely different class of woman and a lot more expensive yeah so yeah probably people who didn't have much money who wanted to recreate those things that the fancy ladies would have would make their own exactly and she's in debt as well she doesn't yeah, so have any money it seems yeah and we've all done our own home remedies we don't want to spend money on la prairie for the face cream but we get the oatmeal and the sugar and we put a make a little face pack on and go oh look how much money i've saved and you look terrible no, i've never never done that oh you're, you're missing out you're missing out on the elasticated <laughs> trousers nick you're missing out well, on no. the homemade face masks it's like you're a boy or something. <laughs> How dare you. Doing. <laughs> and you've never been so slighted. <laughs> and Florence does this openly in the house. As you say, not subtle. She doesn't try to hide it. She's quite open about what she's doing. But still, it does raise some questions amongst the staff. The husband is getting increasingly unwell. Wife is merrily making arsenic face masks around the house. Perhaps things wouldn't have turned out as badly for Florence had it not been for the machinations of the household staff themselves, particularly the household nanny, nurse, Alice Yap. Alice hates Florence. Oh, Nanny Yap. Nanny Yap. Mm-hmm. Nanny Yap. Mm-hmm. She sounds vicious. She does. Like little yeah, dogs and... going... Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> or Yap, 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 maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Alice does not like Florence at all. Hates her. Hates her. And she is only too happy to stir up any bad feelings she can against Florence about her behaviour in the house. So as Jane is getting increasingly sick, Alice is there whispering in the ears of visitors who come to see James. James has some family friends who are on his side of the family, not really friends of Florence, who come Mm. to visit him when he's ailing. And Alice is there whispering in their ear that Florence has been soaking flypaper in water to extract poison and he's getting sicker. I'm not comfortable with this. This is terrible, terrible news. And the friends, they gossip. They gossip between them. And they start writing letters to James's family. His brother, Mark, Michael, who lives in London, and they send him a message that says, come at once, strange things going on here. Well, the nanny can fuck off, to be honest. Um, <laughs> go and who's looking after the kids at this point while she's gossiping in everyone's ears? Yeah, this is again a story where we don't know the what kids happens. Are swinging from chandeliers, running amok with knives. They're all over the place. But no, she's there spreading the gossip. <laughs> I like the message of come at once, strange things are going on here. He's like, who sent this, for God's sake? <laughs> <laughs> where am I going? Come at once, come to where? I don't know. <laughs> So the family are getting wind that Florence may be up to no good. The family, James's family, do not like Florence either. This is really she not... Does, <laughs> well, you know... She's not a popular person at the moment. Well, she is. She, she, she gives a good party. Well, that's all you need. And she, she, she likes people at the Grand National. I don't know. Worse still, Florence, for some stupid reason, hands Alice a letter to post. She is staff. She needs to go out and post the letter. Hmm. Addressed to a Mr. A. Brearley, Esquire. Oh, stupid, mm. stupid, stupid. Alice, God, it's so, such bad luck. She accidentally drops the letter and it like falls open and she just happens to read all of the contents. I, I mean, absolutely. It, entirely accidental. Couldn't be helped. Exactly. That's what happens to letters all the time. Uh, she reads the entire contents. It transpires that there have been an exchange of letters between Florence and Brearley. Now, I won't go into the full transcripts. The transcripts are available online, but there's been back and forth between them about 
the idea of them maybe starting up their affair again. These aren't gushing love letters. There's definitely been some heated exchange of words that's referred to at some point. But she definitely refers to the fact that James is ill, that she's afraid that he's going to die or that he's not long for the world. And mentioning that he doesn't know what's going on. He's so ill, he's almost delirious in in so many words and wouldn't suspect anything, wouldn't suspect anything of their activities. Nothing to suggest that she has poisoned them or there's been any plan between them. But this kind of conversation with a lover, if you're trying to start things up again, the timing is just not good. Well, it's more, it's post your own bloody letters. <laughs> Especially if it's for, All for your lover. All this be avoided if it's just like walk to the post box. It can't have been that far away. <laughs> <laughs> so of course Alice reads this and reports straight back to Michael Maybrick, mm. James's brother. He bans Florence from tending to James anymore. She's effectively under house arrest. He doesn't let her go out. He doesn't want her anywhere near the brother and the rest of the staff completely agree. No, she now knows she's under suspicion. The family, while she's there, while he's still ill, he's not dead yet, are calling for tests of James's food, of water, of his feces and of his urine. They want it tested nice. all for poison. Tests are carried out. No trace of poison is found. However, okay. one of the nurses attending James claims that she sees Florence tampering with a bottle of Valentine's meat juice. <laughs> <laughs> One of James's just, favorite health tonics. Just, oh, I mean, absolutely. It's on the bedside. Um, I'm not. I'm not even kidding. It was. <laughs> yeah. It had to be dropped off there. He loved the Valentine's meat juice. The bottle was later tested and found to contain a single grain of arsenic. Florence would later testify that her husband had requested both the meat juice and the arsenic in it as a pick me up. But he had never I'm drunk sorry. it. He he's taking arsenic by the handful mm. for the past god knows how many years, <laughs> and people are going. There's one grain in this bottle. <laughs> she must have done it, murder. <laughs> yep. The the family and the staff yeah. are searching the house up and down for traces of arsenic. And you're absolutely right. Anyone would be screaming. He takes it every fucking day, and anything else he can get his hands on. James is still alive upstairs while they're tearing the house apart, determined to find evidence against her. Surprise, surprise, Alice Yap, nurse Yap, finds a mm. packet of white powder in Florence's bedroom labelled arsenic, poison for cats. <laughs> it was cat poison. It's not person poison. You can't use that. The family, of course, find all sorts of traces of poison around the house. It was later said that there was enough poison in the house to kill 50 people. Well, there was in most houses at that time. Pretty much, yes. <laughs> and especially in the house of someone who loves poisonous remedies. But on the 11th of May, James dies of his symptoms, of his illness. A post-mortem is carried out and they conclude that he has died from an inflammation of the stomach due to some irritant poison. Arsenic is found in his system, but not enough to kill him. They also find traces of strychnine, hyacine, morphia and, pros and prussic acid, but they think the morphia and prussic acid might have been part of the medicines that he was given by doctors. Yeah, yeah the treatments. And yeah, but strychnine, strychnine and hyacine, probably he was taking those anyway from his own dosing. So you have a dead man and the family baying for the wife's blood. So Florence is arrested on the strength of all of the families going to the the family members and the staff going to the police saying she's done it she's been poisoning him the whole time and she's arrested and tried for his murder that seems very flimsy mm. yes not sure about that at all the case is well it's it's pretty much a travesty in my opinion in my <laughs> humble opinion looking back there are many transcripts and many writings about this case the long and the short of it is no one can prove that james conclusively died from poisoning and no one can prove that Florence did it. If he did get poisoned or that Florence ever gave him any poison, it's just the testimony and the hearsay evidence of other people. Yep. But at the culmination of the case, the judge rambles on and on and on about Florence to the jury, citing her bad character, her affairs, her wrongdoing, the letter that she was sending to her lover. This whole case seems to hinge on the fact that a woman wrote a letter to her lover. She was having an affair. Never mind how many affairs the other guy was having. <laughs> Never mind his mistress and the women he was paying and the drugs he was taking. It all seemed to focus on a very Victorian attitude to this woman did something wrong and now she must have poisoned her husband because good, honest women wouldn't do any of this sex Would stuff. never do such a thing. Not Absolutely at all. Absolutely not. The jury take 45 minutes to deliver a guilty verdict. <laughs> and Florence is sentenced to death. She's going to hang. 
Luckily, it depends on your opinion on the case, the public outcry to this is huge. You can imagine this is very much a sensational case of the I time. I can well imagine, yeah. Across the Atlantic on both sides. Big, 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 big case in the press. The scandal. And people are furious about the sentence. You know, there are cries of shame, shame in the court when the judge reads out, hands out the death sentence. Florence is being hung out to dry and there are petitions and public meetings fighting for her release. And it's so great that the Home Secretary eventually steps in and he commutes her sentence to life in prison. Takes away the death no, sentence. It's, it's better. Or it's, well, is it better? Or not? Well, mm, his judgment is the evidence clearly establishes that Mrs. Maybrick administered poison to her husband with intent to murder, but that there is ground for reasonable doubt whether the arsenic so administered was in fact the cause of his death. Right. I'm not entirely sure what that means. I, I, I don't either. <laughs> it's basically saying that Mrs. Maybrick administered, gave him poison because she wanted to kill yeah. him. That wasn't proved at all, it, I, that I can see. But there was, there's reasonable doubt as to whether that poison that she gave him, if she did, actually killed him. Right. So he could have died from something else. So it's very, it, it, it doesn't, it's very flimsy. So she intended to kill him. But we don't know if she actually did kill him, but she wanted to. I suppose it would be a version of manslaughter, maybe, yeah. or murder in the third degree, or some sort of degree of it. Either way, she doesn't get retried for any of this. Um, she's just changed the sentence to life, off you go, go to jail. The motives are not clear all the way through this, apart from the fact that she's some sort of fallen woman. She wouldn't benefit at all financially if he died, because mm. his will was absolutely a pittance, really. So it's not money motivated, the only thoughts are around the time it could have been if she had wanted to kill him, it would be to avoid the scandal of divorce if he divorced her or to lose mm. custody of the children. But even mm. so... <sighs> Seems like, yeah. Mm. I'm not entirely convinced by that. Yeah, we'll come back to the theories. But Florence would spend 14 years in prison. She spent part of that time in solitary confinement and then the rest Solid. of the time on hard labour, doing a lot of cleaning. That was what the hard labour involved. It was just a lot of cleaning, cleaning, cleaning from morning, noon and night and then going to scrub, sleep. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Scrub, scrub here, mm. scrub, scrub there and a couple of la -dee das <laughs> But she was released in 1904. She returned to the USA. Apparently she spent a bit of time on the lecture circuit talking about the case. Oh, right. And she wrote a book about her, her experiences after her release. The book is called My 15 Lost Years. In later life, she was a recluse. She lived in a apparently a squalid three-roomed cabin uh, surrounded by cats for company sounds like your ideal place <laughs> just a cabin with cats not a squalid a cabin one with cats. not a squalid that's not a squalid one it's a nice you would one make it lovely. i would make, it, would lovely, make it lovely but with lovely cats see there's, there's different between living alone miserable she never saw her children again one of the reports said few residents had any knowledge of florence's true identity and the lady who once charmed victorian liverpool died alone and penniless on the 23rd of October 1941. Among her wow. few possessions was a tattered family Bible. Pressed between its pages was a scrap of paper which in faded ink bore directions for the soaking of fly papers for use as a beauty treatment. <laughs> da, da, da. Oh dear, well, I, I, th I think she was pretty hard done by, I have to say. <laughs> Not entirely convinced by the thoroughness of that um prosecution um or the evidence there i have to say indeed now there is a postscript to this case which i will come on to mm. but first of all what are, what are we thinking about florence and what was done to her oh another little side of it quite a grim after effect her son became a mining engineer and he died in 1911 when he mistook a cyanide solution for a glass of water he accidentally drank poison and died isn't that weird? Why would you have a glass of cyanide solution lying I around I don't know. Place? Well, he was a mining engineer. Maybe you just have... I don't know what they do down there. I don't know. Glasses of cyanide. This is the cyanide around. table. <laughs> this is the water table. Don't mix them up. But yeah, what, what are we thinking? You think she's a cold-blooded murderer? No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> I think it's very unlikely. He seems quite capable and enthusiastic to kill himself. Um, <laughs> really. With all his, yeah, potions and balms and pick-me-ups. Yeah, I think a doctor looking at the case involved in the trial did remark later when Florence had told him about her husband's habitual use of poisons as remedies. He was saying, you, you take them and take them until you die. You become mm. dependent on them. 
but all it's going to do is kill you. So, yeah. I think that's probably what did him in in the end. But poor Florence, it seems like there was a vendetta against her by the family. Well, I think, no, it's his bloody nanny yap. I have to say, I have issue with (laughs) nanny yap. Not happy with her at all. Mm. Um, She's got a lot to answer for. And using all these beauty remedies that will get you in trouble. Just so desperate to make a good impression. She's soaking flypaper to make her, to get rid of her spots. Um because she can't afford to go out and buy it anymore. Yeah, she just wants um, to look good at the party. Yeah, if you've got a breakout, nice you need a party. mask. You need a nice charcoal mask. She could have gone for charcoal instead. If only she'd known. <laughs> but Nanny Yap trying to curry favour with the rest of the yeah, family. Because Nanny the Yap brother... Sister. Yeah, they would have been uh, executors of the will as well. She would have been looked after by them if she'd played yes. along, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. So, the postscript to this story. And I think you'll enjoy this and also get very angry about it. <laughs> okay. Do you know the name Bruce Robinson? No. Screenwriter of Withnail and I. Okay. No, I didn't know that. But yeah. mm-hmm. So Bruce Robinson. I know Withnail and I. Yeah. So we all know Withnail and I. He's a screenwriter for it, an actor himself. He spent 15 years researching one of the key players in this story, Michael Maybrick, the brother. Right, the brother. Okay. The brother. The brother who so wanted Florence to hang. He was actually a songwriter under the name of Stephen Adams. Very successful songwriter in his day. He released about 50 popular songs of the time. Uh, the Midship Might, uh, The Holy City, Nancy Lee, They All Love Jack, all those wonderful, wonderful classic songs that we all know very well. <laughs> he was a Freemason. <laughs> Played organ for them at their meetings. But Robinson claimed in his book, They All Love Jack, that his handwriting also matched that of Jack the Ripper. Oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Bruce Robinson wrote a book, uh, and I haven't I haven't read it. I've read excerpts from it. But he wrote a book, and he spent a very long time about Ripper, Ripperology and sort of debunking some of the myths and, and writing all about it. He did a huge amount of research, but he did have a suspect at the end of it, and he laid the blame with Michael Maybrick. He said that the Dear Boss letters, which again are, are thought to be maybe have been hoaxes, yeah. Some of the handwriting bore a remarkable resemblance to that of Michael's hand. He also theorised things like Michael could have sent the letters. The letters were known to have been posted all over the UK. Michael travelled all over to the UK because of his singing and his playing career. He had access to accommodation in Whitechapel at exactly the right time. He had very various theories about it. Perhaps even more compelling is, aside from Bruce Robinson's theories, is that in 1992, a diary emerged that appeared to have been written by the Ripper, that there were lots of clues in it that the author was actually James Maybrick. Right. So a Ripper... So Jack the Ripper's diary... Yep. ...appeared. <laughs> and what, it was like the, the front like front page where it got like name and address and phone number and next of kin was all filled was in. Fluffy. Like, Jack the Ripper, <laughs> 123 Whitechapel Street. Age 21. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. This, was a, this was a diary that went out and it went through rigorous tests for years and decades. It was never the name of who it was who had written it. You know, there, were, there was this, this document apparently where he was detailing the murders and the crimes and stuff, maybe in the same style as, as the Dear Boss Letters. It's been determined to be a fake. But some people still completely insist that it's true and they feel like there were lots of hints in it about James Maybrick being the killer. There are a couple of other bits of clues that bizarrely link this case to Jack the Ripper. Again, a very tenuous one. I think on one of the early crime scene photos, because there are crime scene photos of of the Ripper case, the initials FM are on the wall behind one victim and people go, that's Florence Maybrick, that's it, because James wanted to kill these women because he was angry with his wife. (laughs) Right, so... (laughs) No, just, I'm sorry, bollocks. <laughs> utter, utter, utter bollocks. <laughs> there is no other word. For- the most interesting bit, and this this is, is a bit interesting. Is it well, interesting? You're still going to love me. In 1993, I don't know what happened in the 90s. Everyone just went, I want to prove who the Ripper is. Well, there was a big thing in the 90s. Remember Patricia Cornwell came out with a whole book and with a crime writer. Oh, did she? In, yeah, it's the American yeah, crime yeah, writer. Yeah, like, yeah, like Patricia um, Cornwell. She, oh, there's a whole TV series and she wrote a book about... And I've got a copy, actually, um, about Jack the Ripper. And she had her own... She was convinced that she identified who Jack the mm. Ripper was and all this sort of stuff. So there was a big thing in the 90s about Jack. And there's, there was a few films as well, like From Hell and things came out. And that sort of... That was that was late ni- well, early from, 2000s. Uh, from Hell was a graphic novel yes. by yes. Alan Moore. We do not speak of the film. The film came out. So it came out. <laughs> so we put it into people's minds. They came minds. out in the 2000s. That but was, then, but then From Hell had been out many years before yeah, then. Indeed. So, uh, no. Well, in 1993, a pocket watch was found, handed in to someone. And on it, it had 
J. Maybrick scratched on the insides and the words, I am Jack, and the initials of the five scratched in it as well. But there have been a lot of tests on this by experts, and they have determined that it wouldn't be possible for just anyone to be able to scratch those words on and to fake this watch in terms of the time. It's no way that it could have been done recently. They were saying, okay, in a roundabout yeah. way, they were saying that unless you were so advanced and had access to really sophisticated means the way that the scratching had been done and the particles and stuff in mm-hmm. there yeah, yeah. indicates that it was it was probably many many years ago around the time of jack the ripper or certainly dates the, the scratches were done at the at a at a time frame that is realistic that doesn't mean that it was jack the ripper it could have been a hoax at the time obviously mm. but it's quite interesting bit of historic evidence shall we say <laughs> i'm gonna use evidence with a Big <laughs> set of hypothetical inverted quote mark things. Go okay. evidence. <laughs> evidence. This is another story. How many poisoning stories have we done? With Jack the Ripper turning up. I think this is number four this or is, five. Yeah, four where or there's five a theory. Now. Exactly. And it's a great poisoning case, a great story, and everything that happened to Florence and what are the theories around it. But off the back of that, suddenly there's all these Ripper theories. Well, that people have spent a, a long paper. time over it. But sell some books, sell some more papers. <laughs> but it's the same with every single theory about Jack the Ripper. Everyone comes out and says it's definitely this guy, and all of us go, No, 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 it isn't, it isn't. But we just don't know. There's no there's gonna be no way of ever proving who it was well i think we've gone some way today in, <laughs> in proving that it absolutely wasn't either of these guys right so we've crossed two people in england off the list <laughs> <laughs> thank god yeah i just love the fact that there's just random ripper facts attached to this case which is a great story mm. but that's what makes the case of florence maybrick so famous and that is the story Ta-da! it is a good story i'll give you that it's a good story worthy of the hallowed episode 47 absolutely <laughs> we all know what happens at 47 more quiet yes very very <laughs> exciting indeed hope you enjoyed it people what do you think of the case first of all mainly do we think that florence was guilty or do we think that she was innocent do we think that she had actually poisoned her husband she had taken advantage of his drug addiction and slipped him a mickey every single night to get him out of the way or or me was florence jack the ripper <gasps> oh my god was Florence Maybrick Jack the Ripper? That's why she wrote FM behind one of the victims. She was just like doing her tag. It's me. <laughs> yeah. She could. What well, do we think Florence was Jack the Ripper? Uh, yep. Innocent of poisoning her husband, but completely guilty of murdering five women in Whitechapel and more Absolutely. potentially. So t- tell us your theories. What do you think of the Ripper theories? Uh, let rip, guys. It's absolutely fine. Apropos of this. If people have listened to really good Ripper podcasts or read Ripper books lately that you want to recommend, chuck them on the comments of this episode and any of the social media posts on here. Because I really, it's given me a taste for really getting into some good Ripperology. Because you guys seem to know your stuff. And if you are going to be brave enough or you have a fancy for the whiskey to try a meat hook, the recipe will be out on the social this evening. So by all means, give it a go. You may love it. Let us know if you do. Be very intrigued to hear your thoughts on that one. And if you like what you hear as ever, come and join us on Patreon if you haven't already. Lots of extra episodes, lots of extra content on there. Come and have a chat. Come and join us. Come and ask us questions on any of the social media chats if you want to know about the Patreon subscription or just want to know what we do at night. And this week, I mean, on Patreon, we had another episode which was very much about taking poisons for all the good things that poisons can do for you, which again did not turn out so well so jump on over on patreon and find out what's going on there thanks for listening guys we have been the people inside the poisoner's cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you bye